one was called Midrash and Lection in Matthew. And I was so moved by that book that I immediately called this man up and told him that I'd been deeply moved by his work and wondered if he'd be willing for me to come over and spend some time with him just asking a lot of questions and he was very gracious. So my wife and I, Christine, drove to uh, Birmingham, University of Birmingham, and met with Michael, had lunch and spent the afternoon. And I've never had an experience like that in my life. Because what he said, what he said was that you can't read the New Testament unless you recognize that they are Jewish writers and they're writing to a Jewish audience. The Gentile presence in the Christian church came much later. Matthew's written in the early 80s, maybe as late as 85. Uh, there were almost no Gentiles in the church at that point. So when they write about Moses, about uh, King Herod going down to Bethlehem and killing all the boy babies, Every Jewish person would have known that's a Moses story about the Pharaoh going down to Egypt killing all the Jewish it's poor a, it's babies. It's an echo would, of an earlier story. Yeah, they yeah. would never have thought that that was literal. Hmm. And even more controversy, he said, look, at Matthew is the one that introduces the virgin birth. Uh, the virgin birth nowhere in Paul, nowhere in Mark. It doesn't come until you, Matthew introduces it. And go back and look at how he introduces it. He introduces it with a 17-verse genealogy that traces the DNA of Jesus from Abraham down to Jesus and look at who he puts in there. He has four ancestral mothers. Each of them pretty controversial in their each way. Of them, each of them in the biblical text, each of them very controversial, each of them by the standards of their day sexually compromised women. One is guilty of incest, one is guilty of prostitution, one is guilty of seduction, one is guilty of adultery. Now why would Matthew introduce the virgin birth story? that way if that's literal biology that he's talking about. So it's just a whole new... Then he, he says, now look at Joseph. Joseph is never mentioned in any Christian writing until Matthew introduces the virgin birth because there's no reason to talk about Joseph, he, so he never appears. Uh, and when he does appear, you have to raise the question, did nobody know about him until the ninth decade? Or was he made up in the ninth decade? And so you assume that maybe he was made up, maybe he's a literary character like Harry Potter and not like Abraham Lincoln. And, and so you, you raise that possibility and then you go back and say, well, if that's a possibility, let's look at, at what it might mean to Jewish people that the father of Jesus is named Joseph. And then you get back into Jewish history and you recognize that the Jewish nation has always been divided. And it goes all the way back to, the, to Jacob marrying two women, Rachel and Leah. And Leah, the older daughter, is the mother of Judah, which is the major tribe of half of, of Israel. And Rachel is the mother of Joseph, who is the primary patriarch of the northern half. So that Jewish history is divided between Judah and, and Israel, Joseph. Roughly. And so the Messiah, one of the tasks of the Messiah is to bring these two factions together. Matthew's genealogy says that he's the descendant of David, so that takes care of Judah. So to make his earthly father, Joseph, who validates him, who authorizes him, who protects him, who names him, make him Joseph, is to bring the Joseph people and the Judas people together. Well, that's just incredible insight to me that I've never thought about. And then he goes on and he says, now, where does he get the bio biography for Joseph? There are three things that he'll tell you about Joseph. You know, in Matthew 1 and 2. It's the only place you get biographical data. He tells you he's got a father named Jacob. He tells you that God only speaks to him through dreams. Mm -hmm. And he tells you that the role of Joseph in salvation history is to save the child of promise. And he saves him by taking him down to Egypt to get away from King Herod. Now go back and read the Joseph patriarch story in Genesis 37. This is Joseph of the amazing... He's got a father named yeah. Jacob. He's identified with dreams. His role is to save the people of the covenant from death by taking them down to Egypt to avoid a famine. And you, you suddenly put that together, and I say it today to audiences, and they've never thought about this. And they say, of course he's a literary character. Of course he's not historical. And then you go through everything else, and Matthew was the gospel I used because in the early church it was thought to be the first. That was inaccurate. They used to think Mark was a Reader's Digest version of Matthew. Now we know that Matthew copied and expanded Mark. But Matthew is also the one that sort of links the old with the new, the genealogy sort of connects Malachi with the Christian story. And so it's a good one to use. But you can see these Jewish connections. 
Jesus never took five loaves and two fish and fed 5,000 people. That's a Moses story. Manna in the wilderness is always out in the wilderness. And the big difference is that Moses had to pray to God to send the manna. Jesus did it himself. Matthew was quite clear that Jesus was superior to Moses, and he does that in a number of episodes. The Sermon on the Mount is only in Matthew. Why is it in Matthew? Because the Jews are celebrating their Shavuot holiday, their Pentecost holiday, 50 days after Passover. And what that celebrated in the Jewish synagogue was the time when Moses got the law from God on Mount Sinai. So how do you portray Jesus? You put him on a new mountain, a new Moses, to give a new interpretation of the law, and you base the Sermon on the Mount on Psalm 119, which most Christians don't have anything, don't know anything about. But Psalm 119 was a psalm written by the Jews for use at Shavuot, at this, at this holy day, because it was a 24-hour festival. That's why Psalm 119 is so long. It's 176 verses, or 172 verses, I don't remember. They need to do something for each hour. That yeah, something for each of the three hours of the 20, there were eight three-hour segments of the 24, and the opening stanza has eight verses, and two of them start with the word blessed. So Matthew takes his opening stanza, makes it the Beatitudes, not two of them, but all eight of them start with the word blessing. And it, that psalm is divided into eight segments because they had to go through 24 hours. So Matthew divides his Sermon on the Mount into eight segments. He's got eight Beatitudes and he's got a commentary on each of the eight Beatitudes. That's what the sermon is. So once you get inside it, it looks so deeply Jewish. And you don't, you don't raise questions like, I wonder where the mountain was that he preached the sermon, because that's not what it's about. It's about seeing Jesus as a new Moses, even a greater Moses. And I don't want to be supersessionist, but Matthew is writing from the perspective of a Jewish person who has found an ultimate meaning in Jesus that relativizes the meaning he found in all of his Jewish heroes. So we're, we're talking about Matthew's experience. We're not talking about the Christian God is superior to the Jewish God, but that gets heard that way sometimes.